Hi, and welcome to The Invisible Body. On this episode, I want to share with you my testimony, how I came to know Jesus. My testimony is uh, very long, um, so I'm going to give you the brief abridged version um, that focuses on things like disability and mental health, uh, because there are a lot of themes, uh, including uh, sexual abuse, childhood abuse, uh, bullying, loneliness, uh, all sorts of things um, included in there that I'm going to skip over just because otherwise it can take quite a few hours to get through my life. So to start off, my name's Christine. Uh, I am the founder and, and maker of these videos of The Invisible Body. I have a Master's in Theology from Laidlaw College in Auckland, New Zealand, and I am passionate about the Word of God and sharing it with other people. Um, I haven't always been this way. Though I started off uh, life in a Christian family, um, I fell away from my faith uh, at about probably age 13, 14, um, because of some pretty serious trauma that occurred when I was younger. Um, so I was sexually assaulted twice before the age of 10. I uh, watched my church family fall apart because of internal politics and division. Um, I was very bullied at school. I uh, just had quite a lonely and troubled childhood. And so when I got into high school, which in New Zealand starts at 13, um, I was determined to be liked, um, to do and to be cool. Um, and so I started uh, hanging out with people that I probably shouldn't have um, and doing things that I shouldn't do, uh, like drinking and sneaking out of home and boys, you know, those boys. <laughs> Um, and basically being kind of a normal teenager but with a slight twist. The issue was that I had started hearing voices at age 12. Um, now I didn't tell anybody about this until much, much later, but um, in hindsight um, I have uh, psychiatrists and things that uh, think that I had um, either early onset schizophrenia or psychosis caused by trauma um, and so I heard voices I saw things um, that I shouldn't be seeing and I was aware enough lucid enough to know that this wasn't normal and I shouldn't tell people so I didn't but then when I started drinking when I was 14 I found out that alcohol numbed those voices um, it also meant I was quite incapable of having one drink and stopping um, and I found out a lot later that that is classic signs of alcoholism um, and so I didn't drink in public after uh, the first incident where I woke up um, next to a boy I didn't know in a state of undress. Um, which scared the bejesus out of me, I'll tell you that much. And so I drank in secret. Now I didn't drink a lot um, to begin with. It was more when things became a little bit too much, when the voices got too heavy, um, whenever I could get my hands on alcohol, um, I would steal f from my parents, I would steal money from my parents, um, I'd get older people to buy me alcohol. Um, yeah, it was it was not a good time of life, um, and high school was was really difficult for me. I became a notorious liar because I was in so much turmoil on the inside that I needed to justify that with outrageous stories about friends dying and stalkers and all sorts of things that. Um, I think I lied about watching someone overdose on heroin. Um, it's outrageous lies that people figured out pretty quickly I was lying about. And I denied it, absolutely. But I felt like I couldn't stop myself from lying. I felt like um, something had 
taken a hold in my life and I couldn't escape it. Um, and I felt completely out of control. And so I started to control my life in the ways that I could. So drinking, smoking, um, my food became a really big thing for me. I started um, uh, to binge and purge, um, so vomiting. Um, I would starve myself at times. Um, it became an obsession with me to to control what I could. And... Uh, that went with study as well. So at school, I threw myself into my study um, with something a little, a little bit extreme. Really, I I did exams I didn't have to do, just because I could. Um, I also started going to the gym later on in uh, my last year of high school, and uh, became quite obsessed with that and being fit um, and also there were older guys at the gym that would uh, get me alcohol if I did certain favours for them which um, is something I am horrified for uh, horrified by now but that was my life um, at uh, the, the year before I finished high school I was um, raped by uh, someone in my youth group because um, I was still going to church through all of this um, and that completely threw me. And, and I think it was then that my mind really broke. Um, yeah, so by the time I finished high school, I was out of control and I didn't know how to get control back. And I had decided in my head that the way to get control back was to go and go to Bible college instead of going to university. Um, I could have got got into any university I wanted to um, with my marks but I decided I need to go to Bi Bible college to study theology so I could learn about Jesus and everything would be okay. Um, particularly my legalistic sense of, of God, um, the idea that if I did the right things he would make everything okay uh, was very strong then and so I went to Bible college at age 18 and Within the first week, I met my future husband. Um, we were going out within a week. We were engaged within three months. And then it was a year after that that we got married. And um, he was very young as well and very idealistic. And I was becoming more and more broken. I was self-harming a lot. Um, I decided that if I didn't throw up, my food then I didn't have an eating disorder but that meant I put on weight in spectacular fashion um, I I really just piled it on um, everyone was very worried about me I was unable to hide my hallucinations from people anymore um, both of our families asked us not to get married and we both refused um, I think he wanted to save me and I wanted to be saved and he became a god to me. I felt like if he was there then everything would be okay. Um, so we got married very young and um, the next three years was hell for both of us. Um, he couldn't cope or didn't know how to cope with my progressing illness. Um, I ended up in and out of psych wards, usually after suicide attempts. Um, I just ate all the time, copious amounts. I became more and more physically unhealthy, um, more and more mentally unhealthy. I was on so many medications that I just lived in a drug fog 90% of my life. And uh, he didn't know how to cope with that and so he became quite angry um, quite withdrawn um, and I didn't know how to cope with his reaction and I became more and more desperate and needy and after three years of a shared hell um, I moved out and moved back to my parents house and that was just devastating for me um, particularly because of the way that my family viewed religion. Um, divorce was seen as horrendously shameful to the family. Um, it was seen as something that was not biblical, so I was told I should go back. 
um, to him, even though our marriage was not repairable. It was, it was, it was broken um, completely in every way, um, which I won't go into because he's not here to defend himself. But it was, there was no going back for either of us. Um, and so that completely broke me. So the year I got home from my parents, uh, I got home to my parents rather, I um, I was suicidal. I lived basically to die for an opportunity to kill myself. Um, my parents made me get up, they made me have a shower, they made me eat uh, well, a healthy food, they made me go for walks. Um, and I did lose weight while I was with them because they basically put me through a regime where I didn't get a choice on, on anything. And I hated them for that. I, I really did. At that time, I was so angry. And I didn't care. I just didn't care about my life. Um, and so uh, I, I was still smoking, though secretly, because I wasn't allowed to smoke at home. Um, I was still drinking again secretly. And I was just miserable I was miserable and my mental state was such that I I had no hope of getting better I don't think any of the psychiatrists or doctors or anything thought that I would ever get better they weren't entirely sure um, what box to put me in because some of my symptoms were very schizophrenic but then some of them were not um, and so they um, they basically told us to that that I just had to find the right medication and and, and um, this would be my life. And so I gave up. I didn't care anymore. And my parents, uh, really in desperation, reached out to their church and said, please, somebody come around and pray for our daughter because she is just broken. Um, this is probably about a year after I left my husband. And so um, I think it was two or three old ladies from the church turned up to pray with me. And I remember very vividly thinking just get out of my house um, with a lot of swear words in, to, in, in that um, phrase. Um, I, I didn't want them there. I didn't want them to pray. I was over Jesus. I didn't care about him. I was so angry. I was so hurt. Um, and so these ladies, they didn't even, they didn't pray for healing. They prayed that God would make himself known to me where I was at. And I was looking at my watch at 3.42 and 42 seconds p.m. Um, I remember it really vividly because I was looking at my watch wondering when they were going to shut up and go home. And God hit. He just hit. Um, it was like in, in a blink of an eye, just like boom. It was like a huge, heavy, weighted, soaking wool blanket had just been lifted off me. And I knew that I was healed. I knew that I was okay. I could breathe. I could feel joy. I I knew that God was there with me and that he was grieving for me. He wasn't he wasn't angry. He wasn't um judging or hating me. He was loving me and was broken for me. And um, I remember standing up and laughing and the ladies were a little bit shocked and I was like, I'm healed, I'm healed, I know I am. And I don't think they really believed me. Um, but I went to the psychiatrist, um, I think it was the next day, I'm not entirely sure, um, but it was pretty soon after. And I walked in and they said, oh, are you all right? You're smiling. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm healed, which um, apparently is not something you should say to psychiatrists if, they, if you want them to take you seriously. Um, and they were a little bit suspect, which is fair enough. They, I think they thought I was going through a manic phase. So I was um, seen regularly over the next month, um, maybe a bit longer. And basically they ended up being like, well, we can't see anything wrong with you. You seem to have got better. Um, so you can come off your medication, which I could either do one at a time um, for one a month for like a year because I was on like 12 different medications or detox like a drug addict. And so I detoxed for a week and it was hell and I laughed the whole way through it because it was wonderful just getting this crap out of my system. Um, which I don't recommend, by the way, if you have a mental health disorder, um, do not do anything like that unless your psychiatrist is there to hold your hand through it. Um, I did it with medical help. 
so um, I went through that, and then uh, was I think it was a month after that I was living by myself in a new city. Um, I was working full time for the first time in my life. I was healthy. I um, I was doing really well in many ways, uh, and in other ways I really wasn't. I was still very, very angry at God, very angry, and I was very angry at my life. Um, and I was, uh, I decided that screw it, I wasn't going to live like a good little Christian. Um, so I slept around um, with men that some of them I knew, some of them I didn't. Um, I drank so much. I just went a bit nuts with the alcohol. Um, I was smoking. I, um, I, started dating a guy who decided to become a Christian because of my story and then I broke up with him when he got baptized because I didn't want to date a Christian um, because Christians sucked in my book. Um, yeah, so I spent a year being really, really angry and running from God and then I moved up to back up to Auckland um, about a year later um, because I was dating a guy up in Auckland and he broke up with me at the airport, which was lovely. And then um, his flatmate was a really good friend of mine and was a youth pastor. And he sat me down and, and basically said, Christine, you've got to stop drinking. Do you not see that you're destroying your life? Um, and I realized in that moment, I think he was expecting a huge fight, but I realized that I didn't have any reason to drink anymore. Um, that actually the drinking that had been a crutch was now being the issue. And so I was like, actually, yeah, you've got a point. I've got to stop drinking. And so I detoxed on his couch. Um, he's an emergency nurse as well. So um, that was quite helpful. And I went through another week of hell um, detoxing. And I haven't touched alcohol since um, because I know that. I can't stop. I, I have that um, thing in me that will go to drunk um, before I stop. I will black out before I stop drinking. Um, so I started AA, which was at my friend's church. And then he invited me to come and meet his vicar. Um, and so I went to meet his vicar thinking I was applying for a, a job at the church actually and I turned up and I had this visceral reaction to this man. I felt something overtake my body and I wanted to rip his throat out with my teeth and watch him bleed to death. I felt like I was an animal and I was physically holding myself in my chair to stop myself leaping over the desk and, and ripping him apart. And he looked at me and he said, you aren't here for a job. You're here because you're under spiritual attack. And I said to him, I don't know what you're talking about. This is the first I'd heard of this. And apparently this man um, had a ministry in um, demonic deliverance. And whatever had been going on in me reacted to him. And it was then that they realized that I, I had a demonic oppression in my life. And... Um, it's quite weird to talk about the whole deliverance process, but it was a series of very intense prayer sessions and I was delivered of uh, seven demonic spirits. And it was after that that I felt for the first time that I was really free. Um, the anger had gone, the, the self-destruction had gone, the pain had gone. Um, and so my healing and my deliverance were two very separate things that I want to make very clear. The mental health thing was not demonic and the demonic thing was not mental health, even though the two of them can hide in each other, um, if that makes sense. Anyway, so uh, it was after that that I really gave my life to Christ. Um, I realized that I couldn't do it without him that he had completely saved me and changed my life and so I ended up going back to finish my theology degree because I wanted to not because I felt like I needed to make God happy but because I was suddenly desperately in love with the word of God and with Jesus and I wanted to learn as much about him as I could and so I went back to um, Bible college and I got my undergraduate 
and I did my master's as well eventually. Um, and it was there that I started having migraines. Um, and it was only about a couple of times a year and then it was about once a month. Um, and I've now I live with them pretty much every day I have pain. Um, and it has become a disability and it's something that I have prayed a lot about um, for healing. And God has told me um, three or four times now that he's not going to heal this. That maybe it's manageable, like I, I might be able to find medication that can manage it. But for whatever reason, this is my thorn in my side. And um, it is through this disability that God wants to use me, not not by um, healing this one, which is frustrating, particularly when I've had healing in other areas. But that's how God wants to work. So that's how God wants to work. Um, but backtracking a little bit, while I was in Bible college, I met this man. I was 26 and he was 19. And I found myself extremely attracted to him. And I told myself, no, he's 19. He's a kid. Um, I am not going to do this. And I had also um, put myself, basically sacrificed the idea of getting married again. Um, if God didn't want that, um, I had done... Um, a lot of prayer and stuff about, you know, yes, I was young, but if I needed to be single for the rest of my life, if that's what God wanted, then that's fine. So when I met this man um, and we were hanging out a lot, we were really good friends. And I had to say to him, look, I'm, I'm really attracted to you. So if I avoid you for a little while, it's just because I'm trying to get over that. And uh, he was like, OK, cool. Um, I don't really feel the same way about you. So that's fine. And then uh, a couple of months later he said to me hey look actually I really like you um I've realized that you're my best friend and I really enjoy being around you and and I'd really like to see where this could go and well that threw me into a complete like muddle because I had no idea what I was supposed to do now because there was no point dating someone if I wasn't planning on it going further because that's just playing with him and playing with my heart and that's not fair um, but I wasn't sure what God thought about remarriage and divorce and all that kind of thing so I then went on this big biblical um, search basically uh, got into my Greek and everything to try and find out what is the whole remarriage and, and divorce thing um, what does God really think about that and I had my mentor who was also the um, principal of the Bible College uh, basically say to me if you love him then don't be afraid um, there is no fear in love and you know God is a God of redemption and resurrection and yes divorce is not the ideal and remarriage is not the ideal but it is um, as a God can work in our brokenness and he is not a God of legalism but a god of love and resurrection and so through that and through my own study which i would encourage you to do for yourself if you have questions like that um and come up with your own uh what you believe god is saying to you um but i ended up going okay let's see where this goes with this young man and um a year after that we were married and we have been married eight years and it has been the best eight years of my life. Um, through that time we have had plenty of struggles. He uh, lives with suicidal depression um, and so some days are really good and some days he is barely hanging on um, but he's here and he is, he is one of the biggest joys in my life. He is the most amazing person I have ever met. Um, we also took care of his mum as she died of terminal cancer and that was very hard but um, a beautiful thing. I got to know her really well and she was just an amazing woman and I'm so privileged to have had her in my life because of my relationship with her son. Um, yeah, so all in all, really, my life started pretty hard and then got worse and then Jesus has turned it around um he has resurrected me he has redeemed me in every way and though i still have my struggles and though life is still hard because life is hard 
he is my joy. He is my strength and he gives me peace that surpasses all understanding through everything. Um, yeah, so that that is my story. I am happy to answer questions or anything. If you have any, please comment below if you have any. If you appreciate this uh, story, I am hoping to do more personal stories um, of others where I will interview with them and get their views on, on life and Jesus and disability and mental health and things like that. So if you appreciate it, please subscribe to our channel. Um, we're also on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, you can also support our ministry on at Patreon, uh, patreon.com, where you can give financially to help us um, get around and, and interview people and travel and all that kind of thing. Um, we appreciate any support you give us. Please share this story if you want others to hear about the amazing work that God can do in their lives. And yeah, I uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, but I hope that you get something out of it. I hope that Jesus really speaks to you. Um, and I would love to hear from you. So please message me, comment below, and uh, I will see you next time. <laughs>